Welcome back to the Blue Door Pup Thunderdome. If you know the boo, then the girls in Minnesota's 87th best daily podcast. A show about everything and zero. Zip, zilch, zippy, doodah, absolutely nothing at all. Coming right at your ass. Five days a week. Sin Shotgun is going to be a longtime friend of multiple programs. Uh, Emery Hunt, football game plan. He's going to be coming up, talking about football in the summer, summertime. It's going to be good. Tell a friend, spread the word. iTunes, Stitcher, uh, our radio as well. Uh, our uh, programming next week, we're going to have 4th of July off. And I'm going to pick one of our interviews from the archives, and we'll uh, just plaster that back up there. But, uh, yeah, other than that, uh, we'll be live all four days next week. Hopefully guests don't cancel. Ah, sorry, Dave. Uh, and it'll be good. And this will be uh, – I love this episode because Emery is a guy that I uh, – you know, made, made Twitter friends with early on, and we've been friends for a couple of years now. And he's been on uh, numerous programs of mine, whether it be uh, the the football convos back in the day, purple for the win multiple times as well. And he, he's just great, knowledgeable, grinds. He he gets it, and he, he's one of the guys to keep an eye on. You know, someone who puts in the work, doesn't complain about his station in you know the media hierarchy because uh, really what what good does that do because i mean lots of people you know myself included at times can could be like yeah th- this should be going faster yeah, they're they're not trusting the process and they're like how come i haven't blown up yet how come i i'm not an espn or nfl network or anything big like that yet but uh, a- emory doesn't because he's too busy working to complain about things cuz that yeah, that does annoy me sometimes. You know, when people get a little melancholy and a little oh, what was me? I, I don't have time for that. I, I really don't. It's not in my wiring, and I think that's why I gravitate uh, towards guys like like Emery Hunt, like a reef, uh, like a reef, like Luke, like uh, Daniel House, etc. Uh, because just people who grind, people who work, people just get it done. Yeah. Uh, also, someone who grinds and works and gets it done is Josh Pelto of Remax Preferred. You know what's going on. Summer rolls along. It's still a seller's market. And, you know, if you're upgrading, here's the thing that we, we figured out. It, this is a, a great time to sell if you're retiring and just headed up to the cabin and going to live out your days on the water. It's great. But you know, a lot of people are starting to get itchy because they're starting to see the housing prices, but then they forget, oh, yeah, we have to buy a, a different house, which is also going to be higher priced. Uh, but don't worry. If you still want to move on up or if you're a first-time home buyer, uh, Josh will get you the best price, whether you're buying or selling. He'll take care of you. Also, returns phone calls. What a novel concept. Yeah, for a realtor. It's crazy. 763-213-4617. 763-213-4617. Josh Pelto, Remax Pro. All right, let's get a little Emory Hunt up in this building. And come back into the Blue Door Pub Studios for how many times have you been on the show? It feels like it's been like seven, eight. Right. I, I remember we did some things way back in a in a in a day when you uh you, you used to do those interviews for why you like football, what, you know, why you love the game and stuff like that, your background. And so we've gone back that far. Yeah, that's a long time ago. I, I, I get bored, so I have like 17,000 shows, and you've been on most of them. So eh, it's all good. <laughs> but I always get good feedback when you're on. Uh, Emery Hunt, he is the man over at Football Game Plan. Give him a follow on Twitter at FBall Game Plan. Also, the most in depth FCS coverage you could ever find anywhere. Those are facts, man. Those are all facts. <laughs> now, here's what I love about you. You cover uh, like D3, FCS. If there was a D4, you cover it, and also CFL. And also women's tackle football. I will actually uh, – I know there's a big time – I think one of the oldest women's football teams in Minnesota, the Minnesota Vixen, but I will be the color commentator for the women's championship game uh, in Salt Lake City, it's the IWFL, the Independent Women's Football League. So we cover that mm. as well, too. Oh, sweet. Uh, so the, do they sweep you out to Salt Lake City on, on the private jet, on the, on the I, 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 IFFL private jet? 
private jet. They put me up to Salt Lake City, and then they say, like, listen, you can um, you can just embrace Salt Lake City for about three days, and then for the next two days after that, we'll put you right to work covering the, the you know the championship game and mm-hmm. also the all. Well, oh, that's pretty sweet. Now, did you did you in football game plan cover the Lingerie Football League at all? No, we didn't, and that's one thing that uh, I would say the both women's tackle football leagues, the WFA and IWFL, really appreciated because they said it's like they people associate women's tackle football with with the lingerie league, and mm-hmm. they hate the lingerie league uh, because it uh, objectifies. Obviously, it objectifies women and takes the attention away from the real sport. But it, it had Mark Rippon's daughter. She was tearing things up. She, yeah, she was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, having a uh, great little injection of football here in, during the summer, uh, how have you been keeping busy besides just grinding out content? That's the thing, man. Uh, we, you know, college football right now is, is doing all the research and pr- producing all these videos. Next month, um, I'll start doing my NFL season previews as well, get those pumped out in addition to the FBS college stuff. So we, we got a lot of football content coming uh, within the next month and a half. Uh, as far as FBS goes, uh, who, who do you like early on handicapping it? That's a good question, man. I think you have to look at Ohio State because Urban Meyer does a great job of developing and getting his team ready to play. I like Michigan. I think Harbaugh has his team right where he wants them. Um, they're going to be in the mix as well. Alabama, obviously, because of who they are. But I also, let's say if I throw an underrated team out there, Keep an eye on Louisville because they have the most dynamic quarterback. And I know people mm-hmm. are talking about um, USC with Sam Darnold, but I can't trust USC as a team. They're not there yet as far as talent is concerned. And when you're looking at a, a sleeper or a dark horse, you look at the team that has the most dynamic player. And to me, that's Lamar Jackson without question. Oh, uh, so a, a way too early look at the 2018 draft. H- how do you think the quarterbacks are going to go? Like, what order do they come off the board with Darnall then Rosen and Josh Allen and Jackson, et cetera? Like, I- if you had to bet right now, like, what, what are, order do they go? I, I'm glad you prefaced it if I had to bet because yeah. the league is stupid. So <laughs> I'll tell you right now, it'll be Darnold, Rosen, Allen, five other players we hadn't heard of just yet, and then Lamar Jackson. And Lamar Jackson would be the best one out the entire group. Now, uh, what round right now do you think Jackson goes? First. Because it's hard to, as bad as the NFL is with talent evaluation, mm-hmm. it's hard to ignore someone that can affect the game like that. You know, they tried to do it to Deshaun Watson. They tried to do it to Johnny Manziel. They tried to do it to Teddy Bridgewater, and all of those guys went in the first. So, you know, I think his Stephen Tim Tebow went in the first round. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think a guy like Jackson's talent, and he has gotten better as a passer every year. Those are facts. Um, and I think he's going to – I tweeted this out a couple of weeks ago. We never really saw Michael Vick work with um, uh, Petrino, Bob Petrino, yep. because Vick went to jail. But what we're seeing now is exactly what that would have looked like with Lamar oh, Jackson. Oh, yeah. Think about that. And so Petrino is known as a passing guru, a quarterback guru, and we see this dynamic talent. Because keep in mind, his freshman year, he was strictly take the snap and take off and run. Last year, you saw him utilizing the whole field, going through his progressions, which is why he threw 30 touchdowns to only nine interceptions. It ran 1,500 yards and 20 touchdowns. So what we saw last year was what we – should have seen what in 2007 with Vic and the, that Falcons team. And so I think Lamar Jackson is just going to continue to improve as a passer mm-hmm. and as a limit. Now, the question of competition always comes in because uh, Louisville and Lamar Jackson were definitely handled by LSU in the bowl game. And, you know, Jackson looked phenomenal you know, uh, up against all American conference competition. Uh, do you think that's a, a factor or uh, do you think that was just a one-off with LSU? I think it was a one-off because it also highlighted a big problem for Louisville all season long. Even if you go back to the game they they should have won against Clemson, their offensive line was terrible the entire season. It was just Mm -hmm. the fact that they had a guy back there that can, you know, erase mistakes as far as that is concerned. But now you fast forward to the end of the season and you're facing a team that has just as much athleticism on their defensive line as you do at quarterback. It's going to be tough to get away (laughs) from that. That's when you you talk about Arden Key, you're talking about – 
uh, Jamal Adams coming down the box. You're talking about um, Kendall, not Kendall Beckwood, but you're talking about these other linebackers back there that are able to make plays. And so they just matched athleticism with Louisville. So if their offensive line improves, I think we're going to see even better numbers this year from Jackson. It still always blows my mind, like LSU, Alabama, and the Miami back in the day just could never could have all the athletes everywhere, but could never get an NFL caliber quarterback. Yeah, that's that's mind blowing when you think about it because you would think any high top high school quarterback in the country would say I can make LSU a champion, I can mm-hmm. make Florida a champion, I can go in and start at Georgia and bring them to cha- to a championship uh, caliber. But no, nah, it, I always find it interesting because you would think in this country with all the high school talent, all these guys that end up being pro prospects, let's say like a Russell Wilson, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's 5'11", you know, 200 pounds, but excelled at the quarterback position. How many of those guys uh, get bypassed by these FBS programs because they're not fully developed yet coming out of high school? And, and that's the biggest issue you see with the FBS as opposed to the FCS FBS wants finished products, while the FCS not only get those guys that are still FBS quality, but they have the stability in the coaching staff that they're going to get the same message, the same tutelage for four to five years. So when that's why you see guys coming from the FCS level that may be better pro prospects than guys that are coming out of the FBS level at that quarterback position because the development, the repetition, and the consistency in the coaching that they get at the lower levels, uh, that they really got developed in college as opposed to a guy that hadn't. That's why you see so many top five, five-star recruits flame out mm-hmm. at the FBS level because they're not really getting developed because they already are finished products. And the coaching is so transient there that they won't really reach their full potential. Wait, I, I, I will not stand here uh, and be party to the besmirching of Brock Berlin. <laughs> oh, I tell you, I'm glad you brought him up. Yeah. Um, because I'm born and raised in New Orleans, played my high school football in New Orleans, mm-hmm. and Evangel High School was the perennial state champion in Class 5A, I think it was, right? A 4A, a 3A. And so um, Brock Berlin was this all-world quarterback. And so by the time I got to my freshman year in college, which was 99, we are playing at Louisiana Lafayette. Brock Berlin, I think, was – Either he came out the same year I did or he was a year after. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he was a talk of the, the state like in the nation. He was like in his back before everybody was on TV. So you really had to read the magazine and who was the parade all American and stuff yeah. like that. And so they were hyping up Brock Berlin. And we always talked about it like, man, their offense is so crappy because the quarterback was literally a, a, their, their shotgun offense had the quarterback aligned deep like a punt. So they snapped the ball way back there. Now it's going to take the you know defensive line a good five seconds to get back there to a quarterback that's twenty yards back. He's throwing seven yard passes, and you know it's almost like it's a bunch of screens going over all over the place because they spread the field because of how far back Berlin was aligned. We was like, yo, he hadn't faced pressure. He's overrated because he's playing this offense. And lo and behold, he goes to Florida, I think it was at first, mm-hmm. and and then transfers to Miami. And continues to stink. And it was just like, that was the biggest issue. Um, uh, please tell me that wasn't a cell phone ring. Tell me that was an old school, like, rotary phone. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could lie, but that was my cell phone. That's the only <laughs> answer yeah. if it sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. The uh, uh, One more uh, FBS question, then uh, we'll put a bow on that. But the Gophers hiring of P.J. Fleck, your thoughts? Listen, I, I've been on record saying, Minnesota is a sleeping giant program. Mm-hmm. Because think about this. You have only one FBS or one Division One program in the state. Is is Division One and then a bunch of outstanding Division Two programs. So, you know, that's why the Division Two programs are so great. And I, I think when you look at PJ Fleck being able to recruit and get that Western Michigan team to uh, uh you know, I think to the Cotton Bowl, you look at him being able to recruit in Minnesota, getting skilled players. Minnesota, yeah. will, Minnesota will always be able to have front seven players and uh, good secondary players and guys on the offensive line. They'll eat that all day long. They'll get that in their sleep. Mm. But can they get those, those speed guys on the perimeter? Can he get that difference maker at quarterback and that game breaker in the backfield? That's where Fleck comes into play. I think that's what he's going to be able to bring. And now Minnesota will be a, a serious player in the Big Ten because of that added element that's lacking from – that's what Ohio State has 
uh, because of Urban Meyer. They was go and get those speed guys, you know, in conjunction with the regular Big Ten recruiting. That's the difference I think Fleck makes uh, with the Gophers. And after they saw P.J. Fleck's Western Michigan team get handled by Wisconsin in the Cotton Bowl, the Gophers are all like, he's our man. He already knows our tradition. Get him in here. <laughs> they probably thought, like, wait a minute. Okay, if we can get those skill players with our tradition of recruiting yeah. offensive line, defensive line, maybe we could be a perfect match. And maybe we won't get blown out by Wisconsin routinely. I mean, we'd love to have Corey Davis. Can you imagine Corey Davis in that go for offense operating off? No, n- never mind, because the quarterback play was terrible. Yeah. 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 Right. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, two two part question on Fleck. Uh, within five years, do the Gophers win a Big Ten West title? And is he still here? I think so. Because when you look at, I look at Minnesota the same way I look at programs like Syracuse and uh, Tulane. Um, and, and let's say a program like Maryland, hmm. you went there, you stay there because it's a tradition rich program. It's like recruiting in the, or playing in the Ivy league or coaching in the Ivy league. You win there, you become a legend and flex seems like the type of guy that cares about how you view him. Right? So I think winning at Minnesota will ingratiate himself with that program and he will become a Minnesota lifer. He will be that he wants to be remembered as one of the greats, not one of those coaches that were, like Petrina, where he's had success at a lot of different places, mm-hmm. but he wants to be that Bowden. He wants to be that that uh, paternal, that uh, saving. So I think that's important for him, which is why I think he is embracing this challenge of coaching at Minnesota. That's a great coaching spot, in my opinion. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, we get, we got uh, all the restaurants. It's good. We got Manny's Steakhouse. Maybe that's why he's here. They, I tell they... you, I, well, I had my – before I moved up here to New York City – area i had the the best slice of pizza i had was in st paul minnesota when we played the gophers in 2000 i want to say it was 2000 2001 oh. and we right so we was we were our hotel was right downtown and we you know uh ordered some pizza to the hotel room. and they, they brought this big tremendous slice of i'm like oh my god what is this and just i had a blast in minnesota do you remember what what the the place was no, because thinking about it, I was like 19, uh, 19, 20 years old. My memory is, is shot. But I, I think um, I remember the guy being like sketchy that brought it. He, had, he was he looked like a bandit or some some type of buccaneer or pirate. I was like, All right, well, as long as the pizza is hot and there's no, you know, nothing in this pizza. But it was it was outstanding. I can't even remember what the box looks like, but I remember it was being being a huge box. Uh, of delicious pizza. I can't remember the spot, man, but it was it was outstanding. Oh, God, I wonder if it was like Pizza Luce or something. Yeah, if I yeah. if I see the, if I see the logo or, or the picture of a box, I could definitely recall it. All right. Well, e- either way, um, I, I'm glad you had good pizza because uh, you lost 47 to 10. <laughs> oh yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> and uh, so I became I fell in love with the Metrodome. How loud it was for mm-hmm. it to only be 50,000 uh, people. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, th- this is a great era of like Assad Abdul Khalik. He's great. Yeah, I think who was the running back? Thomas, uh, Ty- not Tyner, Tepe? Uh Yeah, Thomas Tepe, because he was after uh, Marion the Barbarian and Maroney. Oh, no, we got introduced to Maroney. Oh. And, and um, no, not Maroney, yeah. uh, uh, Barber. Yeah. Because Minnesota beat the crap out of us that day that they put the freshman in, and he got 100 yards, and it was Barber. Oh, okay. I got you. I like that. Oh, man, Ron Johnson was in that game, too. Uh, yeah, it, he brought – here's to see you keep bringing back great memories. Not only Ron <laughs> Johnson was an outstanding receiver, and that was a guy we game plan for, but when we got on the bus to get ready to go to the airport, he was outside, you know, talking with, you know, family or whatever, but yep. he had the baddest-looking girlfriend that we ever seen. We was on the bus like, oh, my God, they make him like that in Minnesota? Like, it was ridiculous. Uh, he um, he is, uh, still has a high batting average. We'll, we'll, we'll say that. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, it, it was Tellus Redman, uh, not, not to pay. Tellus Redman, yeah, that's yeah. who it was, Redman. 101 yards, two touchdowns, 27 carries. Eh, eh, it's all good. The, all right, so closing off the, the, the bad memories for you, uh, the, the draft, the mm-hmm. NFL draft this year, who do you think came away with the best haul? Houston. I think Houston, number one, is going to be in the AFC championship game. Um, so I, I like what they did just by getting Deshaun Watson. Their team has been Super Bowl ready for about eight years. 
And so now they finally get the guy that can bring them there. I also thought the Eagles did a great job. Their defense may be one of the best in the league by what they brought in and um, uh, via the draft. In the secondary, they got two starting corners and Sidney Jones and and Rasul Douglas. They added Derek Barnett uh, to to bring the pass rush. They got Donnell Pumphrey in the backfield. I, I just thought they did a great job. Uh, Shelton Gibson is a game breaker, deep threat that they were able to add. So I thought the Eagles did great. I thought the Browns did phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Kaiser. Kaiser is going to be the starter, in my opinion. And um, that team is going to win like seven games this year because of because of that. Uh, and I think when you look at um, the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on that. What the, when you look at uh, Houston, mm-hmm. the Sean Watson is that guy that can really change that franchise. And I think that was just a great pick going up and getting their guy. I thought they did an excellent job, and Tennessee did a great job as well. And you don't think that uh, Houston or Kansas City gave up too much to to go get uh, Watson and Mahomes, respectively? Not at all. I think when you look at, and it wouldn't surprise me if if I be a, a like a soothsayer right now, um, it wouldn't surprise me to see Kansas City move off from Alex Smith in a preseason because here's how the game is set up. So Alex Smith is only on a one-year deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a consistent guy. He's a good quarterback. I wouldn't say he's great, but he's good. You could win with good quarterbacks. Um, Mahomes is going to go into the situation and is going to ball out in the preseason because he's playing against number twos. He's going to ball out so much that the talk will be how can they keep him off the field, thus driving up the 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 uh, the value for the trade market for an Alex Smith. So now you have this guy going against these backups, balling out to where he's going to look great. Alex Smith becomes, well, we can use Alex Smith. They're ready to move on from him. That's when you look at the Jets. That's when you look at maybe Jacksonville. That's when you look at a team like Denver reaching out and like, hey, okay, we can use this guy. You guys have a rookie that's ready to go. And that's when the Chiefs can recoup, let's say, a first-round pick or something similar Ooh. to what uh, the Eagles did with you guys. Yeah, I was going to say they Bradford did them. Yep. So I think that's something that's in play. But I don't think those guys gave up too much. I thought last year mm. the Eagles and Rams gave up way too much to get guys that I thought were just basically mid round type talents, and it's proven to be uh, correct that those guys are just middling talents that you don't give up that much for. They're not game breakers. Yeah, because just looking at how Houston and Kansas City did give up quite a bit to move up to get their guys, but I think if you're absolutely sold on a quarterback, there's not really a price high enough that you can pay. But don't be a prisoner of the best of what's available in that draft, which I feel like uh, L.A. and Philly did two years ago. Exactly. Especially when you look at and, and this. That's why it's so, so so much poetic justice for the Philadelphia Eagles, because they got to sit there and compete two times a year against a guy that was taken in the fourth round. That's light years better than a the guy. They traded all those assets <laughs> for up in the, in, to get, with the second yeah. overall pick. You know, it, it it does bug me a little bit, though, that Jerry Jones and uh, Stephen Jones are all like, we, we, we knew it was Dak. We knew it was Dak all along. It's like, no, <laughs> your plan A was Romo. Your plan B was Kellen Moore. Your plan C was Paxton Lynch. Your plan D was uh, uh, Connor Cook. And then you're like, all right, we'll take Dak. Right, exactly. It's so funny because Denver right now still needs a quarterback because Paxton Lynch is not that good either. Yeah. And, and that's the other funny part about it. That's why I just hate the whole NFL. That's why I said the NFL scouting uh, process is terrible because mm-hmm. you couldn't just with the eye test, just a basic fan couldn't look at those three quarterbacks and look at, let's say, a Cardell Jones, look at a, a Trayvon Boykin or look at uh, even Cody. I like Cody Kessler at USC. It's like, how could you look at this guy and then say a dude that played eight games at North Dakota State where his backup, which was a freshman, led his team to the championship game and was entered it, went back in, mm-hmm. went outside of the first drive, played terrible that game, but North Dakota State was just so much better defensively than Jacksonville State they win the game. How can you look at all that and say, you know what, those two guys are far and beyond better? And to, you know, double down on it, what made it even worse was that Howie Roseman comes out and say, yeah, according to our scouting department, there's no quarterbacks good or better than these guys, as good or better than these guys for the next three years. Like, wait, what? When next year has Watson and Mahomes and Kaiser, like, what are you talking about? Like, that was an asinine statement. 
Now, the the whole projecting towards next year, do you think that's dangerous in, in draft, or do you have to go year by year? I think you have to go year by year. Now, some guys, the talent just jumps out at you. You can see it. And I remember when we were in college, and obviously we, we didn't go to bowl games, so we're sitting at home hmm. uh, all watching – this Virginia Tech team in a championship game is like, yo, they're really there because this quarterback is ridiculous. And he's faster than everybody. He has a rocket arm. And you just saw him as a freshman talking about Michael Vick. You just saw him as a freshman like, that dude is good, man. And he's going to be – that. that's one you can see pro, you know, projecting forward. He's going to be good. Like, Lamar Jackson is going to be great, you know, like that. Um, but I, I, I feel as though when you – let's say draft Twitter, so to speak, so we'll look at – a guy as a freshman, see him complete a couple of crossing routes and then hype him up to un, you know, imaginable type of hype. Like, let's say a Josh Rosen, mm-hmm. you know, freshman year, he looked great. Sophomore year, he looked terrible. They'll say they'll find all excuses to justify why he looked terrible as a sophomore, you know, just like they'll do for any quarterback that they like. Hackenberging. Um, Hack, exactly. Like all of a sudden he needs a certain play call that can help him out. Like, no, he's just not that good. And, I actually like what I saw from Jake Browning. And up until that game against Alabama, where I saw those traits that you don't want your starting quarterback to have that's afraid of pressure, that's a terrible thing to have. Um, And Bama really scared him into a pick six, a costly pick six right before the half. Mm -hmm. So if, if guys just let guys just progress and, you know, not die on these, these terrible hills, they can have, they could be better at, you know, analyzing or, or scouting quarterbacks because I do think I like the comparison of Rosen's game to Eli Manning. I think Daniel Jeremiah said that it's one of the few things I agree with him with um, because that's a great comparison. So I think guys can play. Donald's a good quarterback. Um, Rosen's good. I think you still win with a guy like Browning. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's how you're supposed to look at it. They, they want these guys almost like people need heroes. They want these guys to be, so far and beyond the next, you know, Joe Montana, next Dan Marino. Now nah, you just need guys that can just play football. And, and if you don't get too high, don't get too low on a prospect, you can really see things a lot clearer. Uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't get your take on the Vikings quarterback situation. Speaking of a guy who's not going to be Joe Montana, Sam Bradford, although he's, he, he, I, I call him the human median because he is like the absolute average top 12, 15 NFL quarterback that you can win with, except you're not overly excited about it. H- how do you see the whole Bradford, Teddy kerfuffle shaking out? I think you you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what he is. He hasn't, I remember he had a chance as a rookie to get the Rams into the playoffs if he wins, they win that last game and he throws the interception on the goal mm-hmm. line. So, um, you're right. 79, 8 and 8, that's about it for Sam Bradford. So, Everything has to go well for him to go eight and eight. And he's decent enough to where you won't, you know, be a terrible football team. He wasn't terrible uh, his last year in Philly, mm-hmm. which is why I understand you need to go get Carson Wentz when you had a guy that just took your team to seven and nine. And now you draft a guy that takes your team to seven and nine. So I, I just think that Bradford is a good enough option to where the Vikings can stay competitive. Maybe you get a break here and there on defense or special teams and pushes yourself into the playoffs, a place that he hasn't been quite honestly in, in any one of his stops. But it also gives Bridgewater the opportunity to, to get back healthy because that's the quarterback the Vikings need. And as was proven when he got in this, as a rookie, should have started the season, gotten as a rookie, went seven and eight. Then the next year they go to the playoffs, should have won that game if the kicker didn't just get brain freeze and kick it straight. <laughs> yeah. I think the Vikings team would have beaten Carolina, quite honestly. Wow. Uh, and so, and it then, you know, so everybody looking at last season, like, oh my God, the Vikings are, which again, the Vikings to me were built like the Texans were last season, like, oh, this team is prime and ready. Then you have the freak accident with Teddy. So mm-hmm. I understand that adding that fifth option. They want to see if he can come back. I like the progress that he's making from what I've seen them show on video and things like that. So I think they're playing it the right way. I don't think they'll get rid of Teddy. I think they're going to keep Bradford as long as Teddy is still working through his, his health. And then they once the, he gets ready to go, then Bradford's going to be gone. All right. So you, you're betting. Yeah, Chris $100 bill says that long-term, say week one of the 2019 season, Teddy Bridgewater is under center for the Minnesota Fighting Vikings, not Sam Bradford. Absolutely. Ooh, I can't. I, I like that. He, I, I'm a big uh, Team Teddy member, but I respect what Sam's done since he's come in here. But it's a 
bird in the hand, two in the bush sort of deal. It says you never really know what's going to happen with Teddy's health. Can he mentally come back to and project to where he was going to be in year three? And it's it's tough. Well, here's the thing. You still have a guy in Taylor Heineke that I like, too. So mm-hmm. it's not like, uh, you know, Bradford doesn't get injured as often as he used to. But he's somebody that that you can't really trust long term. Um and if Teddy isn't back healthy 100 percent, let's mm-hmm. say he comes back and is is just an OK player because he loses a little bit of that game because he's kind of like how Carson Palmer is a dramatically different quarterback since that knee injury in the playoffs. You know, he hasn't been the same guy because he hasn't been uh, as trusting of his his plant leg or his front leg, you know, since he got injured. So he's been a little bit timid, which is why you see him not play as well. Uh, because beforehand he was taking off running. I mean, this is a guy that was fearless in the pocket. Now mm-hmm. he's a little bit hesitant. Um, and it's a shame because he was a tremendous prospect coming out of USC. He ran a four, five, six in a 40 yard oh, dash. Wow. Teddy, yeah. Uh, Palmer was outstanding. And Teddy, you know, I remember it was a preseason game, but he broke somebody off in the preseason when he took off and, and ran and really gave him the old one, two and, and mm-hmm. left the defender in his dust. So if he doesn't have that element, he doesn't need it, but you have to have the ability to get out of the way, and that's what you worry about, which is why I don't mind the Vikings taking their time and letting him get back to where he's mentally comfortable with his knee. Yeah, and it's weird. If Heineke didn't put his foot through a glass door, maybe the Vikings don't trade for Bradford, and maybe it's the Taylor Heineke show. And I know you're showing off your FCS bias there, but come on. <laughs> but I'm just he, yeah. at least. Uh, he would have been better than Sean Hill, even though Sean Hill can do basically what multiple teams have paid Josh McCown to do. I don't mm-hmm. understand that, you know. So, but you know, the Vikings are, are fine. I don't think they're a bad team. They, they, to me, the way their quarterback situation is right now, today, June twenty eighth, is still way better than what the Jets got. Yeah, I mean that's pretty. Although the the Jets are in complete, hey, we're, we're tanking for the number one pick, and we don't even care mode. And the sad part is if they win more than one game, yeah. that is in jeopardy because you can't really tank right in, in, in football because a, you may have three terrible teams with two wins and you lose out on the tiebreaker. Yeah. I, I, I kind of feel bad for Matt Forte, but he's going to make the Hall of Fame getting nine yards on third and 14 screen passes. So he'll be fine. <laughs> he'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, I, I got to ask you, as a former college running back, you know, shorter Stouter, you got some quickness. Uh, a, a short, stout, quick college running back, Dalvin Cook, just uh, falling into our laps. Your thoughts on him? Oh, my God. I, I dream about having the speed of a Dalvin Cook. And people say, well, he only tested at 4 or 5. You tell me watching his film <laughs> that he's not faster than 4 or 5. You, you know, yeah. you rarely see him get caught from behind. And that guy going to that offense on that turf is going to be ridiculous. So, that was a great pick. I thought the Giants would have taken him. I thought, you know, uh, San Francisco would have taken him or Cleveland would have taken him. Um, Jacksonville, I just thought, like, man, for him to fall that far to the Vikings was just a a, a, a godsend because he's automatically the best running back on the roster. And he's going to get those carries, and he's going to turn – he's not going to get those, like – those Jordan Howard yards that everybody's hyping up, Mm -hmm. he's going to actually turn those into touchdowns, you know, and I think that's the biggest key. That can help out an offense. That can help out a quarterback like Sam Bradford. You know, when you put Sam Bradford on that pitch count, that 20 to 22 attempt uh, per game and able to feed a guy the football maybe 17 to 20 times a game, but on five of those runs, he's going to rip off like a 40-yard jaunt and one may get into the end zone. That's the type of running back you want. You know, and as much as people talk about Jordan Howard, you know, I don't remember any of his his big runs. And he he had all those yards and only got six touchdowns, which tells me he's average. So that right there is why I like the Delvin Cook going to Minnesota. That's a huge home run hit for that's the next guy that's going to carry the torch from Adrian Peterson, um, because now you got another home run threat in Cook. Oh, as a Vikings fan, I, I fully remember Jordan Howard's yards because it was all J. Ron Curse screwing up his assignments. <laughs> and it was gaping holes. Yeah. And Bear fans got mad at me because I said the best back on the roster is Tariq Cohen. I'm like, wait a minute. If you look at those huge holes Howard was running through, and he was only getting like mm. six and a half yards or seven yards, those are touchdowns if you put Tariq Cohen back there or Delvin Cook. That's the difference between a great back and an average back. 
Now the 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 debate that will last here for a couple of years is the the Joe Mixon versus Dalvin Cook talk, and a, a segment of the fan base was ready to roll the dice with another sort of sketchy Oklahoma running back again. But the Vikings traded up, had their choice between the two of them, took Cook. Long term, do you think that would be the right decision? I think so because I didn't think I, I may be in the minority here, but I didn't think Joe Mixon was that special of a back you know I thought he was kind of soft for a guy that's six one two thirty. you know uh he went down a little bit too easily he's a little bit stiff athletically I thought P Ryan was a better back um now granted to me he's a bigger version of what the Bengals already have on a roster and Gio Bernard so mm-hmm. he's a big version of Gio Bernard which is why I don't think they got rid of uh the kid from LSU Jeremy I think yeah Jeremy Hill I think it's more of an indictment on Bernard, who couldn't stay healthy. So I think they're going to have two big backs. One just is more of a receiver than a runner. And I think when you look at the Vikings offense and looking for a back that can be that bell cow, I don't think Mixon is that guy because he does just he does doesn't have those natural running instincts. He plays a game like he plays a game like Ty Montgomery playing running back. You know, in, in my opinion, Montgomery is still an asset as a receiver. He looks like a receiver playing running back, and to me, that's what Mixon looks like. Does Dalvin Cook crest a thousand yards a season? Absolutely, because he can rip off runs in, in bunches. And so you only need sixty five yards a game for a guy like Cook that comes on one run. Mm. So he'll have a game where he may get, you know, thirteen carries for seventy five yards, and the next game he'll have a nine carry, hundred and twenty yard game. You know, so he he can cross a thousand just by his sheer uh game breaking ability. When it's all said and done, say fifteen years from now, well probably ten for running backs, but you know. Uh Fournette Cook, McCaffrey, Mixon, whoever else in this draft, who, who has the best career? It's a great question. I, you know, and all guys bring something different to the table. I would say McCaffrey because of how versatile he is. And after that, I would say Fournette and then Cook. Mm. Yeah, I think McCaffrey has a chance to revolutionize what a running back special teams slot guy is. Like if Carolina's up to it. They just got to feed him the ball, man. They can't get too cute. You know, yeah. think about if a guy like, and we're old enough to remember this, think about Barry Sanders mm-hmm. playing in today's game, how they would try to misuse him. Like they're, like the Eagles are misusing or every team that has misused uh, Darren Sproles. Yep. He came out of Kansas State getting 30 carries a game. That's what you want to do with a guy like that. Guys that are game breakers like McCaffrey will find ways to create yards. And they have the perfect setup, too. You got a mobile quarterback in Newton um, who's going to take that extra guy out the box. And McCaffrey has that vision to get to the second level, make one miss, and house it. I mean, he's going to be phenomenal in that offense. Uh, Last bit, then I'll get you out of here. Uh, Is there anyone in the CFL that we should be watching this summer? Like anyone who could eventually make the jump to the NFL? Another great question. I think you have to look at the defensive side. The last uh, guy we saw was a um, kid from Tulsa that, that came out there, a 6'5 safety. I think he's with San Diego. Um, but he plays that linebacker position. I'm not San Diego. Los Angeles, I'm sorry. Yeah. He plays that, They'll always be San Diego. Right, they'll always be San Diego. He plays that linebacker position in the, in the CFL, which is essentially that combo safety. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Dexter McCoyle, he's 6'4", 220. So I think – uh, using that template now, you look at the defensive backs. We saw Adam Begill, who's with the Saints. We saw another guy. I forgot his name. He's a corner. He's now playing with uh, Toronto. But Jeff Matthews, a quarterback, hmm. I say is the one to keep an eye on. He's, uh, is it Cornell or some? Cornell, yeah. yeah. It's him coming out of college, and he's, he played great in the preseason. Uh, his last game, I think he was 12 out of 15, 130-something yards, two touchdowns. So, Jeff Matthews, once his contract is up, I think he'll be able to, to have some opportunities uh, down south. And it's a shame that it didn't work out with Atlanta. He barely got an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's 6'4", 225 pounds, rocket arm, and has a underrated athleticism um, to, to get out there on the pocket. I think he's a better version of what people wanted Zach Mettenberger to be. And I think Matthews will be the next in line coming down south. And uh, one last name for you, Bo Levi Mitchell. Oh my goodness! I mean, you can't get no more southern than that. Yeah. Like I could, I could have been in a coma and woken up, awakened, and you could have said Bo Levi Mitchell. I would have said somewhere between you know southeast Louisiana and southwest Georgia. Yeah. That's where it's from. And I, I've watched like maybe about six CFL games, and three uh, three of them have had him. And I think he's a stud. 
except I, I don't know if it'll translate to the NFL. Plus, he's a little bit older now. I wish to see I wish the NFL utilized and and here's the difference between the CFL and the NFL is that they ha- have that free substitution with the quarterback position. So they have like short yardage quarterbacks or goal line quarterbacks. We saw another guy play in the Big Ten, Drew Tate, mm-hmm. uh, oh, yeah. have that same team. Yeah. You know, was uh, the Stan Peter. So Bo Levi Mitchell, you know, plays plays a, a great brand of football. But the problem is in the NFL, the you know, the ball is different in the CFL. Number one, I don't care what. Ben Albright says, I've thrown both balls. And I can throw an NFL <laughs> ball like 60 yards. I can only get a CFL ball like 40 yards, you know, and I have 10-inch hands. Which um, is weird because the, the, the CFL is a passing league. Exactly. So it, the ball comes out weird. It's, the, the grip is a little bit weird. It takes some time getting used to. And if you've thrown that constantly, then go back to an NFL ball, um, you know, it's it's the transition is going to be tough. So you can only do maybe two years max up there before – you get become accustomed to it, uh, and, and I think that's what will hurt a guy like Bo Levi Mitchell. Plus, guys just like staying up there because it's not as stressful uh, as it is in the NFL as far as media coverage. Like yeah. they actually embrace the players up there in the CFL, so guys find it like college up there. Yeah, S- something, something Warren Moon. Uh, I don't know. That's my rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Emery, w- what's coming up from you? What's uh, shaking that football game plan? Well, we have these FCS season previews that we're pumping out right now. We've done about five conferences. I think the Ivy League was the latest one. So within these season previews, you're seeing um, we have a segment called the NFL Draft Prospects to mm-hmm. keep an eye on for 2018. So we have the top seven coming out of that, that particular conference. So check them out. You get great early look at some of the FCS talent um, that you won't find anywhere else, obviously. Uh, and you know, we, do the, we know, we know we do the real, real yeah. work over here. So, um, that's what you can find in those FCS previews. Also some, uh, just an idea of who's, you know, talented or what teams to, are, to keep an eye on. And it's pretty cool segments that are, you know, that you check out and we'll continue to push those out throughout the rest of the summer. But right now the Ivy league is up. The next one to come out will be the Northeast conference. Footballgameplan.com at fballgameplan on Twitter. Ooh, subscribe on a YouTube channel as well. That's growing and getting numbers. Uh, Emery, uh, I always love it having you on, brother, and mainly because I respect and gravitate towards people who just do the work, and you're definitely one of them. I appreciate that, man. You do the same thing, man. All of your 45 podcasts, I don't care. If <laughs> you come out with I always listen to one. I always call in. I always check and see what you guys are doing because, like I said, like you just said, you do the work. Uh, as well and I could respect you know game respect games or game recognized game as they say but you do the work Andy and I always enjoy chopping it up with you we should do this more often absolutely appreciate you man and exactly like I told you Uh, Emery brings it love him Uh, he's going to be a regular on the show and ah, some hot CFL talk yeah Uh, I'm not gonna lie CFL on ESPN three, it's uh, it, it's not bad. It, it really isn't bad, and I, I will catch myself on you know a, a Friday night just switching on like the Edmonton Eskimos versus the Ottawa Red Blacks, and it, it, it's good. I, I I like the wider field. I like the three downs instead of four, and I like that they just chuck the ball all over the yard. And plus, the the guys who can get uh, a head start. Uh, motioning for the snap guy. I mean, that has to help out D linemen and edge rushers, right? Because you, you can see the guy and, ooh, but they do do it sometimes where the wide receiver will sprint up to the line of scrimmage and then back off like a pump fake, and try to get someone to jump off sides. Yeah, I've seen that. It's good. Uh, but I obviously love Emory Hunt. And uh, something I also love is the way that you guys support the show. The easiest way to do it, bullshow.co slash Amazon. Here, here's what it is. Bullshow.co slash Amazon. Take it right to the homepage. Uh, and bookmark it. It's through our link. And every time you buy a little something on Amazon, or if you're just browsing and to the car, do it, do you. We get a little credit for that. We get a couple uh, nickels in our pocket, and it's been grown every single month. And it's, it, it, it's humbling. Uh, it, it is good because, A, it doesn't cost you a damn thing more other than just clicking on the bookmark thing. And it shows that you, you, you like us. You really, really like us. Also, subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. And if you enjoy the show, here's what you do. Uh, if you're at the barbecue, if you're at the lake, if you're at whatever, just hang out with friends. Or if you're at work and uh, you, you don't want to talk to Terry from accounting anymore, be like, hey, Terry, 
Terry, you have coffee breath and you're fat and nobody likes you, but you should listen to Boo with Andy Carlson, Minnesota's 87 Best Daily Podcast coming at your ass five days a week. Yeah, it's good. Add to the Jerome homie army. Terry, we'll take you too, baby. Uh, thanks for producer Allie for making me not sound so stupid today, but for Emory Hunt, I'm Andy Carlson saying, and Young, sayonara, and bye-bye. We'll talk to you tomorrow. listening to Bull with Andy Carlson, Minnesota's 87th best daily podcast. Download the show on iTunes. Everyone's middle name is Jerome. I got a fever, and the only prescription is more Purple for the Win podcast with Andy Carlson. Come to you all off-season long, covering free agency, the draft, OTAs, and then we're on to training camp. Get the show on 1500 ESPN, Podcast One, and the Podcast One app.